Welcome to Talk Law Radio with attorney Todd Marquardt of the Marquardt Law Firm at MarquardtLawFirm.com. Welcome back to Talk Law Radio. I'm Todd Marquardt here on KLUP 930 AM, The Answer. Also podcasts everywhere, Facebook, YouTube, and TalkLawRadio.com. Today, my very special guest is a Lieutenant Colonel, U.S. Army retired, Jeffrey F. Atticott. He's a full professor of law and director of the Warrior Defense Project at St. Mary's University of School of Law here in San Antonio, Texas. And we'll save some time at the very end today in segment four to talk about the Warrior Defense Project. Uh, But we've been talking about so far the war in Israel and uh, the terror attacks uh, that Hamas uh, made against uh, Israel. And we've been talking about what does it mean for an organization to be designated as a terrorist organization and what are the consequences for supporting a terrorist organization. Then we talked about uh, the rallies in support of uh, the Palestinians or in support of the, the attack. I don't know why people are attending rallies, but I've just been hearing uh, about those in the news. Then we talked about just war theory and uh, whether Hamas was justified in their attack, whether uh, Israel was justified in its response. And so now I would like to talk about uh, something that I heard uh, on Thursday. I went to an event at Temple Bethel Uh, where the former United States Ambassador uh, Dennis Ross to Israel spoke. And uh, one thing he said is that uh, Hamas cannot be defeated. Hamas is is an idea. And so because it cannot be eliminated, it has to be discredited. How do you feel about that? Well, he's got one thing, right? As the Lord Christ said, there's going to be wars and rumors of wars until I come back. He ain't back. So, yes, there's always another Hamas. There's always another ISIS. There's always another Al-Qaeda. Evil is amongst us. It was here before we were born. It's here now. It'll be here when we're gone. So uh, people are very, some people are very naive. You know, well, this will be the last war. (laughs) Mm -hmm. It'll never be the last war. Um, and so you just have to confront it. It's like crime and you have to be strong. You have to have a strong military. You have to use deterrence because obviously, for example, the United States, we can't fight everybody all the time. So we use the concept of deterrence. Uh, President Trump was brilliant at using deterrence. This administration, no, uh, quite the opposite. Uh, our enemies are not deterred. They perceive that we are weak. Uh, they perceive that we might have the capabilities, but we don't have the desire or the will to do anything. And we saw that, of course, with our defeat in Afghanistan and the Russian invasion and the rattling of uh, sabers of China. So, uh, yeah, I mean, it is an idea, just like Nazism is an idea. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, whatever the next generation will have to face. And uh, and so you just have to confront it. The Israelis have been confronting this since they're found since they were founded in 1948. The response from the all the neighbors surrounding the state of Israel, when they were recognized as a legitimate state, what did they do? They didn't say, hey, welcome to the neighborhood. They attacked them and tried to kill them all. And they've been trying to do that uh, with wars uh, for the last umpteen years, and that's going to continue, apparently. So the Israelis, of course, have to constantly defend their right to exist, and they have a right to exist. Uh, Again, you know, you can protest, you can do whatever you want. It's a free country. I salute you for doing that. But I wish you would look at the other side um, if that's your mindset, because no matter how thin the coin, there's always two sides to it. But most people, they don't want to they don't want to look at the other side. I've got my mind up, made up the Israelis and then fill in the blank. They'll use these little terms like colonizers or whatever it is. Um, It's simply not historically accurate. It's not logical thinking. It's not critical thinking. That's for sure. So. I like to think that I support Israel, uh, not because I know anybody over there, but because I share values with them. We we have the same Ten Commandments, and we have uh, shared democracy. Uh, Why do you think we should support Israel? Same with you, Todd. They they share our values. I mean, the Judeo-Christian ethics, 
but the values of freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom of press, Hamas doesn't have that. Uh, and again, I think Dennis Prager said it best. He said, imagine if the Israelis laid down their guns, what would happen? They'd be destroyed. Imagine what would happen if Hamas laid down their guns, what would happen? Peace would break out. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of the bottom line. Again, their negotiating position is we want to kill you. And the Israelis, uh, you know, for too long, in my opinion, they've been very soft on Hamas, very soft on Hezbollah to their north. And that puts them in a very dangerous situation, just as we've been very soft under the Biden administration with Iran. Iran is a state sponsor of terrorism. And then just circle back to our first segment. I'm sure some of your listeners thought, well, if you can't su supply material support, which is money to a terrorist organization, how's the Biden administration send them on $100 million? Wouldn't that be a violation of the Material Support Act? Yeah. How are they allowing Iran to get billions of dollars by not enforcing the embargo? Isn't that a violation of the Material Support Act? And of course, the government exempts himself from that statute. But right. as a practical matter, yeah, you know, you're doing exactly what you are prohibited, what we're prohibited from doing under the federal law. So you think that uh, if we stopped sending money, then that would help deter these types oh, of attacks? No, no question about it, because the puppet master is Iran. And uh, Iran is going to get a nuclear weapon. And you think it's bad now. Just wait what happens when they get a nuclear weapon. So we've got to deal with the bigger issue of Iran because they supply $750 million to Hezbollah every year. They supply a you know almost the same amount to Hamas every year. Without that money, these organizations could not build these missiles and bombs and guns and things of that nature. Iran is the, the head of the snake. And again, you know, everybody knows it. And why are we negotiating with them you know, you cannot negotiate with evil and expect them to keep their word. If you're a student of history, the British tried to do that with Adolf Hitler. They came back, hey, we got a peace treaty, yay. I mean, you're naive beyond naive. With dictatorships and totalitarian regimes, you negotiate from a position of strength. The only thing they understand is deterrence, the application of lawful violence or, um, you know, deterrence. And so Iran has to be dealt with. I know one thing, the time to stop Iran is before they get the nuclear weapon, not afterwards. It's too late. Good point. I wanted to ask you to talk about your book, Radical Islam. Why? Because I think it's a good time for this to be taught in universities so that people don't buy into the misinformation that uh, Hamas and and the Palestinians uh, have a superior right to live there. Yeah, so the, the root, as you indicated earlier, is what I call radical Islam. Now, the vast majority of Muslims, they do not buy into this ideology of radical Islam, but a lot of them do. And of course, the ones that do, they believe that they have an obligation to conquer the world in, uh, you know, for, for God, Allah. And they will kill anyone that stands in their way. And oh, by the way, uh, so I'm not accused of Islamophobia, they have killed more Muslims than Christians and Jews. So they will kill anybody that stands in their way. Again, let me repeat that. They've killed more Muslims than Christians or Jews. Wow. And so it's, you know, that's the, that's the problem. Now, many of these people, for example, in Afghanistan, the vast majority of the population, they can't read and they can't write. They can't even read the Quran to know what's in it. You have these radicalized individuals that tell them that, the Quran commands you to kill and murder. And they point to certain verses in the Quran. There are violent verses in the Quran. There's peaceful verses in the Quran. Mm -hmm. They go straight to the violent verses and they say, this is the will of God. And if you die in combat, you do not have to go to the judgment seat of Allah because it's a works religion. You work your way in, good deeds, mm -hmm. rituals. Then you're judged at the judgment seat of Allah. You either go to heaven or hell. That's classic Islam. But you can bypass that and you can go straight to heaven without going to the judgment seat of Allah if you die in jihad, which means you literally die fighting the infidels. And um, so that's still a works process because you have to kill yourself in combat. But, um, but we could do a, good, a lot of good by just teaching people how to read. Uh, well, yeah. <laughs> I mean, you've got to close down the Hitler youth camps because, again, in Germany, they had Hitler youth camps where they propagand 
propagandize the kids. Mm -hmm. We know that Hamas in, in, you know, puts out literature to little children in their schools, in their elementary schools, about hating the Jews, killing the Jews, and this is occupied land, and we need to you know, take back Jerusalem and take back the whole thing. So, and the kids, that's all they hear. Right. And therefore, they grow up, and there you go. Uh, I call it closing down the Hitler youth camps. In the long term, you need to close down the Hitler youth camps. And the best people to do that is Islam. You know, they need to have a reformation to, you know, do that type of activity. And again, um, you know, it's not going to happen overnight. But in the short term, when these individuals in Hamas and Hezbollah and the Muslim Brotherhood and Iran use violence, we have to respond with lawful violence. They use illegal violence. We use lawful violence. Okay, well, when we come back after the break, let's talk more about those distinctions. Uh, we just have a minute left. But I, I wondered, uh, could the neighboring countries uh, do more to uh, provide a stable government and a stable education system for the children? Oh, yeah. The hypocrisy is, is, is beyond belief. The Egyptians, you know, on the other side of the Gaza Strip is the Egyptian side. They close the border. They will not allow the Palestinian civilians to come into their territory in Egypt to set up refugee camps. And yet they, you know, they cry crocodile tears for the Palestinians, and yet they have the ability right there on the ground, open up the gates, let them in, we will fund them and, you know, house and, and vet the individuals so they're not Hamas members, and, but they won't do it. And so the Israelis are blamed, but why not blame the Egyptians that are right there? And there's a lot of land in the Sinai Peninsula there, huge amounts of land. We've got to take another break. We'll be right back. This has been Talk Law Radio with attorney Todd Marquardt, brought to you by the Marquardt Law Firm. You can learn more at marquardtlawfirm.com. And be sure to listen to the full Talk Law Radio show Saturday mornings at 11 on 930 AM, The Answer. Each week, attorney Todd Marquardt talks about the law. His mission with the Talk Law radio show and podcast is to help you discover your legal issue blind spots. In the beginning, God had one law. Don't eat from the fruit of that tree. Then came the Ten Commandments. Now we have federal, state, and municipal lawmakers that won't stop creating new laws. Laws that might impact you without you knowing it. Listen to the show and drop a line on Facebook or email host at talklawradio.com and let the host know what you think of the show, the topics you want to hear, and whether you want to be a guest.